June 1975, at the University of Manchester, began an investigation of 17 human and 22 animal mummies. Some of these were subjected to a radiological survey at the Manchester Royal Infirmary. And after inspection, one human mummy of an adolescent of about 13 years of age was selected and was taken to the medical school to be unwrapped. These x-rays are of that mummy, number 1770 in the museum catalogue and they show some of the reasons for its selection. Underneath the cartonnage head cover, the skull was in fragments, and the lower part of the legs were missing. It appeared that the mummy was in poor condition, but there were also points of interest. What, for instance, was the rounded object lying close to the ends of the leg bones? There was a lot of speculation about its nature and purpose. Before any action was taken, the team discussed the best method of working. Finally, the unwrapping of mummy 1770 began. There were two layers of bandaging. The outer layer was narrow and arranged in diagonal patterns. And when this was removed, we found wider pieces of linen running lengthways. We carefully lifted the bandages and exposed the lower part of the cartonnage cover. This piece, which lay over the chest area, was completely separated from the headpiece. A large number of dead insects were discovered among the bandages. These had invaded the body and its wrappings after it as a food source. Specimens were taken from all parts of the body for closer investigation. The part of the mask which covered the neck and right side of the face was damaged. This was removed and then the fragmented bones of the neck and skull were picked out. Fortunately, the bones forming the upper jaw and the face were still intact. Cleaning later revealed damage to the left side of the nose, where the embalmers had introduced the iron hook during the removal of the brain. A similar defect was seen in the base of the skull, where the hook had emerged in the cranial cavity. After the removal of the skull bones, the cartonnage mask was carefully packed, ready for cleaning and conservation. Then we removed the cartonnage chest cover for treatment. Oh, it's fine. Go on. Just move up that bit. Lovely. When this chest cover was finally cleaned, it revealed a brightly painted funerary scene. Once the bandages had been cut away from the chest area, it was possible to see the arms, which were crossed over the chest. No, that's, um, Here, we discovered the two gilded nipple amulets. There was little skin tissue left on any part of the body. What was present was very dry and delicate and had to be removed with extreme care. Despite this general lack of skin tissue, some was found on one of the hands, and this was removed for examination. Okay, I think we can lift this up fairly oh, easily. Oh, yes, no, that's very nice skin, isn't it? Yeah. 
the first real skin that we've seen. You've seen that real thing? That's from the skin. Yeah. You can see the creases in the, in the skin. You can see that we can tend to things on the while investigating the hands, there is some skin there as well. we found gilded finger stalls. This indicated that the body had been treated by the embalmers as a person of some status and importance. The remaining bandages were removed from the trunk, and we found that the cavities of the chest and abdomen were packed with mud and bandages, but did not contain any organs. Resin was found in the intervertebral discs of the spine and was also seen at the end of some of the long bones. But curiously, very little was present on the wrappings. Next, the pelvic cavity was explored. This looks remarkably like a male penis, in fact. I think we'll have to take this part off before we can uh, really look at it properly. This false phallus posed one of the most puzzling questions. The embalmers had provided both male and female attributes, the false phallus and the nipple amulets, for the deceased in the next world. Why? And see just what part, um, how that continues, whether it goes into the pelvis or whether it comes up into the anterior abdominal wall. So if we lift this up now, that's obviously the cut section of the, the structure, whether it's a penis or not. But it is interesting because it's obviously continuous with this piece of bandage which looks as if it's been pushed down. It seemed that they themselves were uncertain of the sex or identity of this person. It's just a roll of bandage, isn't it? We moved on to the unwrapping of the legs. And it was here that we made one of the unexpected discoveries. When the outer bandages were removed, they revealed a pair of brightly painted funerary slippers. The curious round object noticed on the x-rays was found to be a pair of artificial feet made of reeds and mud. The right one was carefully constructed but the left one was simply an irregular bundle. These were intended as substitutes for use in the next world, since the real limbs were missing. The lower parts of the legs had been amputated. The left one below the knee through the tibia, and the right one above the knee through the femur. Artificial limbs made of mud and reed had been provided, and pieces of wood were used to splint the bones to the artificial limbs. Embedded in the mud around one of the legs, we found a small snail, which we removed for examination. The exact time of amputating the legs remains a matter of speculation, but it's likely that this occurred shortly before death. This may have been the result of an accident, or may have been carried out intentionally. The examination of the body brought to light various puzzling facts. There was the generally poor state of preservation and the absence of internal organs. There was the curious distribution of resin and the provision of both male and female attributes for the deceased by the embalmers. Yet, this was an elaborate preparation for the next life with the inclusion of gilded finger and toe covers, painted slippers, cartonage covers, and artificial limbs. Various explanations were put forward, but carbon-14 dating tests carried out on the bones and bandages of 1770 finally provided the answer. The bandages dated to about 380 AD but the bones of this adolescent were about 1,300 years older. The body had been rewrapped in the Roman period, probably because it was believed to be the body of someone of considerable importance. But the exact identity of the person must, 
even then, have been uncertain. This much we can deduce. We can even reconstruct a possible likeness. But the name, the origins, and the true appearance of 1770, they will always remain a mystery. <laughs>